And thank you also to CKGSB for having me today. It's a, such a privilege to be here and to be able to share this virtual podium with so many accomplished speakers and panelists. As we're running a little over time, and this is an exciting topic, I'm going to jump right in. I will start by saying when you're thinking about foreign investment and domestic demand under the dual circulation strategy and some of the comments and remarks that have been made in the presentation so far, there's never been a more fascinating time to be watching China's economic development economic strategy um, because you're really clearly seeing the government take actions shaping the economy for the future um, so with that in mind i'd actually like to first turn to professor lee and oh i will know that this will be a bilingual panel so we have a yu yan zuyo policy you should feel free to answer questions in whichever language you prefer um, i will speak a little bit more in english except for wei jiao shou i will direct my questions to him in chinese and uh, for the interpreters i i'm happy to translate for myself so um, Li Jiaoshou or Professor Li, um, I thought it was very fascinating. First of all, that index that you shared um, and the survey that you do with the companies was amazing. It was a really illuminating insight into China's growth in the last 10 years. Um, but when you talked about kind of the actions taken by the government to address systemic risks, if we're thinking about, you know, the current climate in China, um, I'm curious, one, in the businesses that participate in your strategy in the survey, how they're thinking about um, shifting their businesses in light of recent strategy pronouncements like dual circulation, and also what are the current um, systemic risks that you see the government taking on and what should um, what should private enterprises in China be thinking about in light of that? Well, thank you. Uh, uh, that's a very good question. I uh, I hope I can uh, uh, give a good answer uh, to your question. I had a talk with uh, alumni yesterday, uh, and uh, I think one of the uh, consensus I think I I heard I hear from the table. Uh, was that uh, many of them are concerned, right? Um, I think one of the concerns they have has to do with the fact uh, that the, the implementation of the policy, uh, the direction of the policy uh, uh, are not uh, as clear as, uh, uh, as before. And I think one of the things they are uh, still trying to figure out uh, what, what are they supposed to do? Uh, so I think one of the things uh, having more policy clarity uh, would help. And I think uh, in particular with, you know, with the notion today, we're talking about uh, the three different, uh, the three, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, income redistribution, right? The, the, the sort of uh, the, um, uh, and pay, uh, right? the, um, uh, and I think one of the things uh, many of them are concerned. You know, well, they are, they are going to do more social uh, responsibility, and uh, but what 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 exactly uh, does it mean? And I think one of the uh, clarifications I think would be very useful, and that's for the recent policy, right? That uh, for the financing policy for the in the financial sector, and I think uh, things are happening more or less stabilized, and particularly for uh, CKGSP folks, and, and particularly because the, the large banks are, are asked to uh, lend to uh, private firms. And, and so they do go to private firms and they actually go to CKGSP alums because they represent the top of the cream. And so uh, the large banks got the top of the cream and the, the medium and small banks who usually who used to serve them are now facing intense competition from the large banks. And so they, they then have to move downward. And so uh, on the one hand, uh, the policy uh, were intended to alleviate the systemic risks that China may face in the future. Uh, I'm, I'm worried that this could actually increase uh, the asset uh, riskiness, right? So they would make the small and medium banks to go after more risky assets, right? To, to, to do more loans with uh, uh, firms that uh, they would probably not or shouldn't do business with. And I think that those are the, my main concerns uh, with this policy. Uh, and then of course, there's always the positive side, which is uh, with banks going uh, down the ladder to serve more and more firms. Uh, that should make the economy uh, uh, better uh, and more efficient. Uh, but again, it's always uh, 
balance between efficiency and risk and how how do you uh, you know draw the line and where what you should do and it's always uh, i mean i don't wish to be a regulator here in china but it's uh, it's something that i think uh, they are trying to do this balancing act so i i i feel their pain right well, thank you, Professor Lee. I think being a regulator in China is a is a um, very con consequential and important role, but not without a lot of challenges. You, you say um, I like um, innovation and risks. I've talked about a regulation versus integration, but that's a, that's a better formulation. Um, I'm going to turn first to Mr. Elton Huang and then to Professor uh, Wei partially because I'd like to hear kind of along the same lines. Um, Elton, I mean, in your role, you're, you spend a lot of time helping foreign companies or investors to better understand what's happening in China, the trends for investment in China. Um, and in this context, as we're looking at you know, the policy changes that we're seeing as a result of the dual circulation strategy and what the implications are for foreign investment in China and how that's linked, of course, to seeking to boost domestic demand, domestic consumption. Um, how are you advising foreign investors or foreign companies on how they might be a part of China's dual circulation uh, agenda and growth and also China's supply chain ecosystem? And what are the challenges and opportunities that you're seeing and talking about with your clients? Thank you, Mary. I think uh, the question is really about the the world is more like uh, uh, the polarized, I would think. And uh, you look at from the foreign investments perspective, if you ask one of the C-suite, because in my job, I got the privilege of meeting those C-suite on a weekly basis. So when we sit down, the first question I got asked often is what's going on with the like the geopolitical issues like between these two nations. I think the key questions is about the interpretation of the dual circulation. From the foreign perspective, I think I heard one of the interpretation is the dual circulation is about just local supply for local demand, which means there's no kind of incentives or there's no kind of welcome signal for the uh, foreign investment or foreign participant in the domestic market. China, China, China is trying just to uh, have sufficient supply from the local market uh, for local demand. So, but if you look at the China, the part, even the multinational C-suite here in China, they have very different interpretations for the dual circulation. And uh, regardless of those, the uh, domestic players like the PO, private owned company or state owned company, they believe just uh, uh, restriction, uh, restricting those foreign play or foreign participant in the local economy. It's about just the supply chain and the uh, reform uh, by providing high quality talent and capital and funding and also the technology just to give more supply to the domestic market and just to unleash the potential of the domestic consumption market and also to capture the full potential of the market. So I, I totally agree with um, Professor Wei. It's about the policy neutral and also the uh, financing neutral. It's, it's not about some the uh, ownership, whether this is a POE or it's a foreign multinationals. And they should be traded equally here in the domestic markets to capture the potential of the market. So this is the point one. The second, if you look at the recent uh, development and uh, as Professor Lee mentioned about the regulatory change, I think the foreign investment needs to understand the dynamic of the market in China. But in the meantime, they need to understand how China is operated. A look at all the regulatory change, probably it will be certain, uh, I would say the, the, the uh, probably lack of the coordination among all those regulatory bodies. And some of the uh, regulatory bodies, when they kind of making certain regulation change, they might not have some sufficient uh, assessment of the impact of the market. But those things happen everywhere in the world, not only in China, right? Because people are trying to address certain issues, then they just make certain regulatory change. And the, probably they will not uh, have sufficient analysis about the overall impact in particular to the business. So I think, People need to understand and also build those risk factors into their return investment analysis or entry analysis. So if you look at the arbitrage, and uh, Professor Lee mentioned the interest rate is uh, much higher. So the returns from the foreign capital, probably their expectation on the return is lower. 
So there's a certain markets like I think in China for, for the, this so-called upcharge. And also the growing domestic market will also attract a lot of foreign investment. The question is how to can take those risk factors into consideration when you assess those opportunities, calculating those returns. The highest the risk probably you, uh, you have, then the more return you need to build in into your financial models when you're deciding on certain investment decisions. Another point that I think is about the power of the government. Professor Wei just mentioned about the probably the influence of the government, but I look into the pandemic impact. You look at the control of the pandemic, a big government will play an important role, a critical role. But if you apply that same models to the regulatory uh, change for managing a market or certain business issues, probably this will not work out that one, there's no one fits all system or the policies for both pandemic control and the economic management. So I think that that's the points we need to learn. And uh, this is not a China specific issues. This applies to all. Um, but look at the opportunities. I still believe it's huge. Look at domestic consumption market and also the efficiency of the capitals. And also you could look at a new economy here in China. We have many new areas we need to further explore in the biotech and the new materials and the new energies. We're talking about carbon uh, in zero a lot. So there's a huge, huge opportunities here in China. But the dynamic will also have certain risk factors, as I've said. So we need to kind of work, probably do more homework, I would say, just to have more kind of assessment when you make any decisions here in this market. Thank you, Elton. And you know, I fully concur. Actually, I share your optimism, particularly around um, new new technologies and new frontiers. But also, I think your point about the role of regulators and how some of the act actions taken by the Chinese regulators are very consistent with what we've seen elsewhere in the world. You know, in some ways, China's gotten out in front, but also China's fintech market was so such a global front runner that it's not surprising. Um, and I know in in Dr. Wei's presentation, he also talked about the need for um, and uh, Fajr, like a rule of law based society, which of course in recent documents from the government has also been an emphasis of the development for the next five years. Um, and as a follow former lawyer myself, I think when you see some of the regulatory actions taking place now, it's always important. And I find myself often saying to put some of these strategies in the context of also the, uh, the development of the rule of law in China over the last decade or two. I mean, even in terms of antitrust and other things. So thank you for that. Um, and then I'd actually now like to turn to Wei Zhao Shou. Professor Wei, just now, you talked mainly about private sector and also investment from the private sector. Uh, but the, the, the topic of this uh, passion is about the foreign investment. So my question for you is that, that to draw about uh, dual circulation policy. It has disrupted uh, the investment mix in China. So when China adopted this dual circulation policy with the domestic circulation as a mandate, uh, build an environment that will ensure that the investors benefit from this policy. With foreign investors um, in this context of dual circulation. This is a very good question. Since you asked about uh, dual circulation, maybe there is a mis certain misunderstanding about uh, this policy. Uh, China and the President Xi Jinping over recent years made a lot of uh, commitment to, to opening up our market in the Boa uh, Summit uh, to, to 2018 and to also the Boa Summit uh, in 2021. They made an uh, announcement about uh, China's uh, further open up. And uh, he mentioned that uh, to delink the Chinese economy from the international economy 
will uh, hurt uh, both parties, the Chinese economy and the rest of the world. So they made a clear announcement. So this is the bigger background for us to understand this uh, policy. And China and the, the regulator CBRC uh, tried to open up uh, China's uh, financial market and also uh, China's Reform and Development uh, Commission uh, introduced uh, the negative uh, list as the access uh, to the Chinese market. So the due circulation policy needs to be understood against this big background. So the rebalance, as mentioned by Professor Li, is very important. And uh, I have been working as an advisor to the Chinese government. So we have been advising the Chinese government uh, about two things with regard to the dual circulation. To talk about the domestic circulation, we will we'll have to avoid the case uh, that uh, there is an uh, excessive uh, investment uh, across provinces uh, in China for overseas investment. In the past, uh, uh, the Chinese local governments uh, went abroad to attract uh, overseas investment. But now we can see that uh, the local governments uh, were poaching each other for investment. Uh, this is what I mean is that the excessive investment uh, from local governments for investment. So this is the first piece of advice we offer to the Chinese government. If well, all the local governments want to develop a full supply chain or value chain, then they will compete excessively for investment. And we will have to uh, the, uh, build a bridge between the two circulations and open up these uh, two circulations. And to, to develop the overseas circulation, we will also be aware of one thing. I remember that in 2012, when we were studying the globalization trend, we were already aware of the trend of deglobalization. And this trend is already verified. But recently, we have been talking about our increasing concern over deglobalization or even the decentralization. That is, uh, the, the, it will continue to pursue globalization, but without the participation of China. So that is why I say that we will have to open up the two circulation, link up these two circulation. And uh, to talk about overseas uh, investors in China, or where to invest, whether to invest, and uh, you will also need to look into the private sector. In the beginning of uh, China's uh, open up uh, policy, and uh, the private uh, sector in China worked very hard uh, to attract investment from uh, overseas investors, but now the, it's, it's the opposite. That is, uh, you, the overseas uh, investors uh, need to invest around the private uh, sector uh, to build up uh, the value chain. This is because that the private sector, as also verified by Professor Li, is that uh, is uh, most sensitive to the Chinese economic development and uh, policy changes. So I think that for the overseas investors in China, you have to look uh, invest around uh, the private sector to see where they invest, to go with them. There's a, another additional point I want to mention. That is other than the due circulation, uh, we need to have the third, uh, that is uh, to link up the economic circulation with uh, the ecological circulation. Uh, that is what we call the circular economy. Uh, there are many good uh, circular uh, economic projects in Japan. We can learn from them. I think that uh, the overseas investors uh, can work uh, together with us to build up uh, this third uh, circulation. And uh, this is also related with our commitment uh, to uh, carbon neutrality. 
and uh, so this also responds uh, to the need of the foreign investors and their strengths and also the demand in china so i think the third circulation that the circular economy is very important that offers a great opportunity for the overseas investors to work with the chinese counterparts thank you uh, thank you professor wei the third uh, circulation that is not only important for China, but also for the whole world. The third circulation is a really um, a beautiful contribution because that's not just an issue for China, but that's a global issue. Um, you know, I am conscious of time, but I did actually want to follow up uh, uh, to pivot from that uh, back to Elton because you were talking earlier a little bit and, you know, thinking of the circular economy and some of the opportunities in, in China, whether for foreign investment or, or just for the business climate in general, whether you see connections there um, and what, what you see as, um, you know, whether it's about the circular economy, um, decarbonization, or you mentioned a couple technologies including biotech where where are the exciting trends that you that you're that you're seeing for business and investment i think you need to unmute sorry matty yeah just unmute uh, I, I totally agree i think uh we already point out those areas we are attract, attracting a lot of investment and also the attention on a worldwide basis uh, for example i let's take that the biotech as one of the examples I believe the growth engine or the probably the R&D hub will become a China instead of just US. So I'm not talking about some country replacing the other or others. Actually, they are multiple kind of centers or hubs for certain key uh, industry. Uh, biotech and uh, net zero and those carbon related industries are really addressing the key issues all the human beings are facing, not just one nation. So I think those area, um, the couple of key points i think we, we need to pay attention and dr wei and already addressed the key three elements one is the funding and capital and talent and the ip and technology china us do have a lot of uh, areas to collaborate on not just to compete um, actually the technology and the talent and also the capital both countries have uh, sufficient supply if we can just explore the area in particular by industries to select those areas for more collaborations, then we probably can achieve a lot of amazing results from. The other area, I think the foreign investment uh, nowadays is very different from probably 20 years ago. People are talking about more about the asset and wealth management in a lot of the PEVC sectors. And those are the key areas supporting the real economy. Uh, when we talk about the uh, innovation, innovation is not just about technology. Innovation is also about those like, for example, like the asset securitization, just to support all those new industries. So I think in China, we are really seeing a lot of innovative activities or initiatives from the talent, technology, and fundraising as well. So I think those experience, if uh, as a group at the B schools and CKGSB, we could do more kind of study or case collections on those aspects and also do more propagandas. In particular, say some the definition, even the dual circulation, we have different definitions across the, uh, the uh, other territory across the globe. So we should probably just as a think tank or thought leadership kind of uh, stakeholders, we should be more active or proactive in driving uh, those initiatives of do dialogue on those and the promote the collaboration so that the real good collaboration to put a, a lovely thought I like the idea of the concept of innovation in manner. Um, you made a really good point there. We're almost at time, but um, in thinking about kind of the more business and professorial of a side of things, I want one final, I guess, quick question for Professor Lee, if possible, because you started towards the end of your presentation to touch a little bit about the RMB exchange rate and monetary policy. Um, so I just wanted to ask, you know, what trends you expect to see about a floating exchange rate and the implications that that might have um, for, you know, foreign investors in China, um, and if you could briefly comment on that. 
Sure, Matty. I, I think China must adopt the floating exchange rate. It, 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 it is a requirement for China to become a uh, you know, largest country uh, uh, in the world stage, and uh, that's a must. Uh, but to move there, and China need to do more. And I think one of the things that uh, uh, as China move to a floating exchange rate, there will be more currency volatility. And to economists, I think policy volatilities are okay, as long as policy vol currency volatility brings a more stable economy. And I think more stable economy is what we want. And currency can be volatile as hell, and who cares about it, right? So that's one of the adopt. I think that's one of the things our policymakers should um, adopt. Uh, the idea is that currency are shock absorbers of the economy. And they shouldn't be the, uh, you know, the, uh, the economy is the shock absorbers of the currency, which is the reverse, right? Uh, so that's some, something I think uh, it must be done. Uh, for national firms, uh, I think uh, I'm not too concerned about multinational firms uh, because they operate in a floating exchange rate uh, for a long time. I'm more concerned about Chinese firms that they, who have operated mostly under a fixed exchange rate. And I think uh, as the Chinese economy begins to move into a floating exchange rate, one thing must be done is to open capital market, allow more investment, cross-border investments, because the only way to hedge currency risk is through operational hedge, where you have to do cross-border merger and acquisitions to hedge your risk. You can't just use financial instruments to hedge your risk, those are short-term. Long-term hedge must be operational. You must position yourself globally to become multinational firms. So Chinese firms will have to become multinational firms in the future. Thank, well, you. thank you. I feel like that could lead into a whole nother discussion that we could spend probably the last hour, hour on, um, you know, how China will manage that transition as it goes through this kind of final phase, particularly to become the world's largest economy. Um, and, you know, as the world, of course, absorbs China's rise within the global economic and trading system, which have, has been the most fascinating um, kind of development to watch over the last few decades. But with that, we are almost back on track, just slightly over. I promised I would try to do. Thank you to these wonderful panelists for such you know, thoughtful and pithy remarks. We covered a lot of ground in a short period of time. And thanks again for joining me in this conversation. And I think back to you, Ira.